the footage during the, the no-hitter in Cleveland, and I was just made aware of this, you know, there was no TV coverage back then. And the way the world worked, there was something happening at Cleveland Muni, and the phone started to ring in the newsroom, and a local news crew just got in the car and drove out there with a little camera and took a little footage of that. So much of what you saw tonight has never been seen any place else, other than a few eyeballs in places like Cleveland and Oakland. Uh, the reaction of Dennis after giving up the home run to Gibson in 88 is something that I had never seen before. And the people that produced that documentary did a masterful job in storytelling. They ferreted through endless hours of previously rarely seen video to find reactions and shots that just weren't pulled off the telecast. So, uh, Tony, thank you again for being with us. And I, the first question I have for you as a a fan of those teams, um, when you listen to Dennis speak and in listening to you speak over the years, it seems to me that you guys have processed the game the same way. Is, is that a result of the time you spent together or when you got there in 86 and he uh, the following year, were you the same kind of baseball minds at the start? I didn't really... Um learn enough about Eck to agree that you're, you're hitting it right on the head as far as uh, how close we are in uh, philosophies, love of the game. You know, and Eck came over and he tells that great story, which is true. Well, he didn't say the background. And when I was managing the White Sox, he drilled Fisk and a couple of other guys, on, I thought, on purpose. And he looked in the dugout and I was yelling at him, see. And then next thing I see, he's there in Chicago. And, spring training and so I said you know I hadn't forgotten so we steal a third with a six run lead just to let him know that he didn't appreciate it so when he comes over I just thought oh man how are we going to get through this and it was uh, I did now an important point this is worth you, everybody being here because you're going to hear this first Don Zimmer the day that he got traded called me who knew him from Boston he also knew him from Chicago so I didn't know that and he said to me you know what you're getting I said well, I hope we get an arm. I know we need. He says, no, two things. And you heard it from uh, Hearst and you heard it also from, from Ron Darling. Two things Eck will do. Every time he takes the mound, he will be ready to pitch and compete. It could be in spring training. It could be a B game on a backfield. He will always be ready to compete. Now, that's a heck of an attribute that every time. He never had a, an off day where, gee whiz, I got to go out there. The second thing, which is more important, and you saw it with Gibson, he will never make an excuse. And throughout his career, he was always going to take the blame, just like he did with the pop-up in uh, Boston, uh, just like he did with Gibson for two hours, stand there and get hammered. Uh, and when Zimmer said that, I went, whoa, you know, just we got to look at this. And very soon in his time with the A's, you start to realize what we, what we shared. And there were a lot of guys, Carney Lancer, we really had a great, very passionate team. I'm sitting back there with Jack Morris, and, and I, you know, Jack's one of the most passionate competitors. I used to yell at him a lot, too. For, uh, but um, it was this love of the competition. It was love of being a teammate and uh, putting on everything that you had into the game, which means if, if you're not nervous, you don't care. And, and that's, that's transferred into now. He's just, you know, we're, we're like family. Would, would you have been able to implement the kind of bullpen philosophy that you did with, and there were terrific uh, support relievers in that bullpen, Gene Nelson, Greg Cattaray, uh, Eric Plunk, Rick Honeycutt. I mean, I'm, I'm going to miss guys over the years, but would any of it have worked without Dennis Eckersley specifically? That's a very good point because it got misinterpreted at times. And uh, the one that I always mention it's uh, and it comes out just like like I did it I did what Dave Duncan the great pitching coach recommended Dunk was the one that said to me and after after we'd had this uh, off season by Sandy Alderson where he added these amazing pieces he says you know we're in spring training and I mean we had it all I mean for example we had McGuire and Conseco he and I got Dave Parker to hit between them Bob Welsh a great pitcher so he said, how good do you think we are? I said, really good. I mean, our coaches, we all think, and we catch the ball, we run the bases. 
good base hits. We got more power. He says, uh, well, what do you think about Eckersley? I said, I think he's, you know, we all agree, he's a legitimate closer. He said, do you have a chance to win a lot of games? Said, yeah. Oh, I got it, Dunk. If we had good setup guys, but they're not the ninth inning guy. And don't anybody fool you. Getting three outs in the ninth inning. When you sit there the whole game and your team has worked so hard and you walk out there with that responsibility, it is virtually impossible for a lot of very talented guys to be tough enough to do it. And they had it. So Dunk's a guy that suggested, and I said, oh, I get it. If we're going to be ahead of several games in a week, the more often Eck can be the guy, the more times we're going to clubhouse as a winner. So the thing that's been misinterpreted is, you know, when that was so successful, other teams would do it. And number one, they did not have a team that was ahead that often. So if you've got two times, two games to win in a week, you better shoot the works. And number two, they didn't have the setup guy that could get to the ninth inning. So they would, here would be the closer, and he'd be there waiting for the ninth, and they'd lose games because they had inadequate relievers. So it was that kind of combination of very good relievers. If uh, the greatest thing to happen to the Oakland A's as a franchise was the White Sox firing you in 86, the, the next greatest thing to happen to the A's might have been Dennis Eckersley running the streets in Chicago and coming to grips with one of his own problems. When he arrived, and it, getting back to the film, it, it comes across that nobody really knew that personal side of Dennis, and when he arrived that spring, clean and sober, how he was a different guy. Did that come as a surprise to you to learn that he had conquered these demons? And at what point did you share that story with each other personally? Uh, totally surprised. The scouting report, uh, we were out there, both Florida and Arizona, looking for protection. And when the scouts reported, Eck was a guy that made the most sense. There was no mention that he had to have this awakening that winter, uh, just like he was healthy and throwing. In fact, we gave up six runs that day, so we thought, you know, he's not the act we had known earlier. Uh, but as he, as he got into it, uh, in fact, he was well known for being a party animal. So we watched him in day in, day out. He's out there and he's running early and running late, clear eyed. And so, you know, we said, wait a minute, you know, this guy is, he's watching what he ate. Uh, we'd had a couple of team parties and he's drinking Perrier. And, uh, so it, that was part of being lucky. We were lucky to get him. The one thing that I would, you know, I want to be honest like Eck, um, me coming to Oakland was not a real break because anybody that would have come over there that had decent baseball background uh, and could build relationships. My, I learned to manage from guys in the minor leagues like John, Johnny McNamara, way back a guy named Gus Nierhaus. Building relationships, trust and respect nowadays, you need it. It's not like the old days we could just demand. I was good. I would learn to be good at that, and, and that was our, one of our focuses. But the team that Oakland had, I know a lot of guys that would have won, gone in the World Series three times, so I was a fortunate one. It wasn't them. Well, we know better than that. You're being a little modest, but that's, it's, a, it's a great sentiment to pass along. Here's another one. And, and folks, by the way, if anybody has a question for Tony specifically, because this is also, we're documenting this on uh, .com, and this is going to live forever digitally. If you have a question, step up to the mic, and we would be glad to entertain any thoughts you have. Um, one for you too, Tony, and I know that uh, you and Dave Dombrowski cooked up a terrific World Series team this year uh, in your time as a consultant in Boston, and beforehand you've watched how bullpen management has evolved, especially in the postseason. If, if we knew then, in the 80s, what we know now, would there have been any different choices for you in, a, say, a 1990 World Series against the Reds when Billy Hatcher was just insanely hot? And I, I could keep going into fanboy mode here, but I won't. Would any of that new philosophy have done anything different for you? So you're asking for my opinion? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to give you an honest opinion. Um, I think there are a couple of damaging potentially damaging things for our game. And, you, and I need to qualify it, especially for someone like you. I know is right in the middle of all of it. We survive as a staff by getting as much information as possible. Anybody that ever 
played for us, Dave Duncan was our, our hitting coach, was myself. We sought information and, and we massaged it. We weren't in the dark ages. A lot of stuff of our strategy was built on base on the basis of good info. But there is an exaggeration of what the information can do for you to the point where when you start disrespecting scouts, we call it observational analytics. When you start disrespecting player development and how important it is to coach, tweak, uh, then that's not good for our game. And that's happening because there are a lot of teams, and it translates into your, your question about bullpen. There are a lot of teams that, are, are, that really believe in these numbers, and they're going to the point too far where they're writing scripts. The game is so doggone dynamic that you have to do what Dave Dombrowski said after the World Series. We have tremendous information with the Red Sox, but it's uh, handed down to the field people respectfully. And if people, the field guys respect the information granters, then you blend it, right? So the bullpen is a good example. As long as I can remember, the bullpen by committee to pitch a game from inning first to inning nine has been a very useful technique if a couple of things happen. Suppose you get rained out and you're backed up or you lose a starter for some reason. You can pitch the bullpen and get optimistic about winning the game because you can create these, create these matchups. But to do it purposely and try and do it for 162 and mix in a couple of starters is full of holes. And one of the ones that's not so subtle is a lot of the magic of relievers nowadays is that hitters do not see them very much, especially in the other divisions or, or in the uh, interleague play. You may see the setup guy and the closer. You may have three or four at-bats. So everything kind of sneaks up on you, you know, kind of breaking ball. Well, if all of a sudden you've got 20 at-bats instead of four, you're exposing these relievers, and it's going to catch up with these guys that are, are using their bullpen so extensively, number one. Number two, you have um, the, the, the problem of keeping the arm viable for somebody's talent. They just, it's too stressful. And last but not least, the biggest problem with a bullpen game is, as compared to the, a good starter, is if one, or for sure two of those relievers don't have a good day, good inning, you probably lose the game. Yeah. So you contrast that with a starting pitcher, uh, whoever the starting pitcher is, and he goes to six innings and he's given you, they've given up two runs or three runs, or into the seventh, and now the bullpen's got to get, you know, nine outs or seven outs. Then you can play around. The guy comes in not good, and you can get him out after a, a, a hit or two. So my point is that right now that there's this fascination with the opener, and, 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 and it's, 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 it's not, it's not uh, something that you can win with consistently over time. So in, in circling back to Dennis Eckersley and his greatness and so much of that success in Oakland was built on the backs of Stewart, Welch, and Moore and – whoever else was in that four and five spot, Storm Davis or Kurt Young or whomever it may have been, great relief corps and the whole thing kind of, it was an equation to get to Dennis's greatness at the end of the game. It's still the best way to, to win enough to have a chance to play in October is to build a solid rotation that can get you to the last third of the game. But if you're strapped and you have guys like the idea of two times through the lineup, that's old. You know when it's old? It's been done for years. If you had a starter that's got two pitches, you know, you may get through the lineup twice, but the third time they've seen the two pitches, they may subtract one. Yeah. But it, so if you, all, if you have starters that, are, that, that can't get deep, then you, you be creative. And I, like Tampa Bay was, they were very creative. Some guys were hurt. But as far as trying to build your, uh, your strategy of pitching that way, it ain't going to work. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have a question for Tony? Feel free to step up to the microphone. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so X energy on the mound, did you hate it when you played against him? And then did you kind of love it when uh, he was on your team? Or how did that make you feel? Yeah, that's a really good question, man. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> um, well, he was more a starter when I saw him in the other league. And, and, but he had that. And... We have always, uh, I'm talking about we, our coaching staff, have always embraced and respected the other side when it was, when they knew they were, we knew they were competing against us. And I, I mentioned him again, you know, Jack Moore's Hall of Famer. 
When Jack took the mound against you, every inning that he pitched, he's grinding and he's snorting. And, man, you, you know, it's, I mean, so even though you see it, you know, number one, he's really into it. And number two, which I think is the most important point, if it's sincere, you get away with a lot. When Eck did that thing, he wasn't doing it to, hey, watch me and get on TV. It was a release of, of emotion. So today, you know, it's gotten to where a lot of players are emotional. And if you get the game-winning home run with all the pressure, if you strike out with bases loaded, you're going to get ripped. So if you do it and it's sincere, a lot of us give a lot of leeway to that. And with Eck, it was always sincere. I, I think I should know the answer to this, but was it was Terry Steinbach or Ron Hassey back there for game one, the Gibson home run game? That's good, uh, good question. In X first full year, 88, uh, Terry was a converted third baseman with a lot of potential. Uh, so Dunk being as brilliant, he would coach the catchers too. Uh, we brought Terry along slowly as far as understanding the right pitch because you have to call a good game. So what we would do for most of 88 and part of 89 if we got down to the last couple of innings, if Hassey didn't start the game, Hassey would come be the relief catcher. So Hassey was the catcher. And I'll give you another piece since we're here, and we saw the film. You saw that pitch that Boggs struck out on like that one time, the high fastball? That was a pitch that uh, Eck was, should have called. And I'll give you an, you don't know this one, you're going to like this one. Uh, when he got two strikes on Gibson, uh, Hassey looked in just to be sure. And Eck, I mean, and, and Dunk, would remind him. So he went like this to Hesse. Which means out over the plate and up. Vin Scully, who was calling the game, saw that he says, you know, it looks like Duncan is, is moving Lancer to the line. And why would he be doing that? Because he didn't know. He was told him, finish him out of the plate and up, which he did on most of the pitches, except, this I show you how what a margin of how uh, history changes. If he'd have thrown him a high fastball, he might have got a base hit to tie it, but he wouldn't hit a home run. Oh, that's, that's amazing. And he struck out Boggs with that pitch in the, in the championship series. That is unbelievable. So at the moment after he walked Mike Davis, who, as Eck mentions in the film, was an A the previous year, player you're familiar with, is there anything, any remote chance in the back of your mind that you're thinking, pinch hit, two-run dinger, we lose? Or are you thinking... Let's just, you know, let's keep them on the... I mean, they're, they're, that couldn't even have been a thought in your mind at that no, point. No, no, it, it, it's, it's, it's really a great point because for Eck, he walked Davis because he had 27 home runs for us in 87. So he really respected his power to the point where he walked him. Eck, uh, Davis had good speed. Kirk Gibson, late in his career, had become... I mean, he was a really great competitor, great player, had great power, but he became a great hitter and one, one of the best two strike hitters in baseball. When we did our, even though we didn't have an extensive scouting report because we didn't think he was going to play, not sure. When we watched all the video, he had gotten real wide and was a good two strike hitter. So that, when I'm sitting in the dugout, I'm worried about uh, Davis and we throw a few times. When he stole second, my biggest fear, and you managed with the fear of the worst and hope for the best, was that this two strike hitter would get a ground ball up the middle or a blooper. Never that I think that he's going to have to bottle the park. It's unbelievable. Anybody else have a question for Tony before we call this an evening? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, you kind of touched on it a little earlier, Tony, with the numbers and the analytics that the game seems to have gone to. And I'm just curious, as somebody who actually had the chance to attend the scout school in 2015, um, it was shortly after that that they started trans transitioning to more of an analytical side. Now it seems to be that they're starting to come back more with the human element scouting as well. Um, and what I see is that we're actually finding where it's going to be a perfect blend of the two. Um, do you feel that that's becoming critical um, since the numbers are pretty much available to everybody now that you're going to start needing that human eye to differentiate again now? Or where do you think that stands? I think that you're uh, describing the, uh, the biggest... Um issue for baseball ops in the 30 organizations, whether it's the major league level or, or how they teach their kids. Um, too often, if you question that they go too far, you come off old-fashioned and not appreciating. And the fact is, I, I respect there's so, so much better information nowadays 
that's there and it's useful. But you you got to respect, starting with the scouts. You know, David Eckstein played two World Series. You know, I, I seen Craig Consul who was really bragging about the uh, about the metrics. Well, they should. It's, uh, Milwaukee's doing a great job. But Craig probably wouldn't have been signed because his, he wouldn't look good on, on paper. So it's respect the scouts, observation analytics, respect coaching. The guys know how to coach and make guys better. And then put them both together. If you overwhelm the, 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 uh, the traditional, you're not going to be as good. If the traditional disrespect the information, you won't be as good. And uh, I had the pleasure I, uh, in Boston, led by Dave Dombrowski and their group, uh, it's total respect going both ways. It's very effective. Yeah, I would, I would say the answer to that question is that the 2018 Boston Red Sox hit the sweet spot there. Tony, thank you for the time. Thanks for being here. We appreciate your, uh, your generosity in time. Uh, oh, do we have one more question? I didn't mean to cut you off, sir. We're here among friends. I just wanted to know what you think about the shift, and there's been talk about them banning it in baseball. I, I missed the question. Uh, the, the shift. Oh. <laughs> and, and they're talking about banning it, possibly. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. That's probably one that, you know, when you, when you manage, you learn to do the dance. They ask you a question, and you dance and dance and dance, you don't really answer it. <laughs> so that's a really good one, because if you, if you ban the shift, you're penalizing the information and the use of it. But at the same time, uh, our game has gotten to where the, you know, the action has gotten more limited, and it's not, it's one of the things the Red Sox did. You know, they put the ball in play, they ran, took the bases, and if you get more base runners, it's more entertaining, and we don't want to lose the entertainment value. So we have actually had this discussion, some of us old-timers, and there's a real mix. Some of the old-timers say, hey, if you use that information, and some of us think it put two infielders on each side of the base. Uh, you can shade them up the middle if you want to, but that's, a, that's one that's uh, being debated right now. It's going to be interesting to see what the powers decide. Any last thoughts on having watched the film, uh, your thoughts on what we've gone through here tonight? Well, I appreciate that, Matt. Uh, I talked to Eck. Eck has seen it, and he says, Tony, you're going to enjoy it. It's good. And I, Eck, he's such an honest guy, caring guy. I watched it, and I, I applaud MLB uh, and the way it was pieced together. It's a very real portrayal of, uh, of a, a very special guy who had his one career as a starter, had his issues, and, and you get a chance to – he's a unique – uh, way of communicating. Uh, so I think it was really, really well done, and I know it's going to be very well accepted when it comes out officially, what, Thursday maybe? Yeah, uh, Thursday night, as a matter of fact. That, that's an endorsement that should read right on the uh, lobby card as uh, Tony's given it a thumbs up. Again, Tony, thanks. A sincere thanks for your time tonight. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for being here, everybody.